Good evening and welcome to After Hours. Joining us this evening is a person, well, you and I have consistently met over the years by fate, accident, or whatever. Joining me is Doc, or otherwise known as Splitting the Sky. Welcome to the show. Good to be here, Patricia. And, and nice, nice to bump into you again after all these years over the phone while you're getting your, I think, hair done on the movie set. That's right, yeah. yeah. So, Gustafson Lake, mm -hmm. I can't believe it was 15 years ago. Mm. It seems like it was five or, but not 15. That's true. It's moving pretty fast. Move pretty fast. So, there was an article in the newspaper and it called it a complicated legacy. When I think of legacy, I guess I think of something being left behind for everyone or something learned or for someone else. Do you think mm. there was a legacy left by Gust Gustafson Lake and what happened there? Well, yeah. Basically, I feel that uh, the lesson learned from Gustafson Lake is that uh, you just can't, you can't treat in the indigenous populations in the region here as if, um, as if there isn't some form of res you know, acknowledgement of the question of indigenous title. Um, many people know that, for the most part, uh, the lands acquired here in this province particularly were acquired by Homestead. And uh, Joseph Trutch, back in the day, just basically said, no, here's 360 acres of land, go work it, it's yours. Uh, people never really sat down to deal with the indigenous populations. And for the most part, what you had was colonial encroachment and theft of land. Mm -hmm. And so in 1995, uh, there was uh, a few of us that uh, basically had come together to conduct a spiritual ceremony. And, in the process of conducting a spiritual ceremony up in, up in, uh, way up at uh, Gustafson Lake or near a hundred mile house, um, we had been sort of uh, approached by ranchers and uh, been threatened by ranchers and um, threatened at gunpoint actually. And uh, so subsequently uh, we took a defensive posture and though it was really a, it was it was a whole question of a spiritual ceremony, but we ended up in a defensive posture on the land, on the question of title, because uh, once they said you're evicted from this land, the question then became, well, who owns the right to show us a deed? Show me a deed. Who right? owns so, this land? So the lesson learned here in, in 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 that 15 years, why it is like you get a full page article in the uh, Globe and Mail about it, written by Robert uh, Mikas. Uh, the reason is is that uh, uh, this uh, for in 1995 it based the standoff which landed uh, which uh, was going on for 79 days, um, which uh, saw thousands of rounds of uh, bullets fired by the RCMP, the emergency response team, and as well as the Canadian military with the use of the Joint Task Force too uh, in, in in illegal operations and you know on Canadian citizens the. Uh, so what you basically saw is you saw a protracted struggle that ended up uh, uh, for the first time openly dealing with the whole question of title in this province. And, and, uh, and, the, and, and the fact was that there was also 42 attempts uh, to bring that issue of title before the courts on federal levels, but by our representative at that time was Dr. Bruce Clark. Oh, yeah. And he was uh, pretty, actually one of the foremost experts on it, on indigenous law, uh, international conventional law relative to the question of title. Um, and uh, of course, some other courts would not hear it because to hear it would mean that they would have to validate that they were in violation of international law. And the international law, of course, um, most people think, well, today they, they got treaty making going on and that there's this treaty commission and that uh, there's the proper angle is being uh, approached. But the reality is, is that uh, the treaties were made a long time ago and they're validated in international law. And that's what the 1763 Royal Proclamation was all about. It was validation of the right of indigenous peoples to own and control their lands. And the only way that the colonies or the colonists could uh, get those, uh, acquire that land was by either through direct purchase, right, uh, mm -hmm. a financial compensation for the lands in the international agreement and or, and or, you know, outright surrender of the land. If they didn't meet those conditions, then, uh, then title still rested within the indigenous population, so. I guess I'm wondering, because wondering, you bring up all the things that happened at Gustafson, and it wasn't just there, it was also on the other side of sure. Canada mm -hmm. with um, the Mohawks and some of their confrontations. Yes. So here we had military, we had guns fired, we had um, 
cars being exploded. And I just wonder, in fact, a couple of people asked me who I was going to be talking to today, and I told them who and what it was about, partly. Mm -hmm. And nobody knew what Gustafson Lake was. No. And it makes me wonder, all of that that happened, especially yeah. the government, uh, yeah. military part of it, mm -hmm. like. What did it leave behind? Does it leave behind? What happened to the people who were involved, for example, like Wolverine? Yeah. Well, Wolverine is, uh, he, a lot of people don't know, but uh, besides being a very brave-hearted man and, 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 and having confronted the military and the uh, RCMP head up with thousands of rounds being fired at him and the people that were in the camp, but uh, Wolverine today is, is also an accomplished organic farmer. Uh, so I, I visit Wolverine uh, almost every, at least once a week, uh, where we only live about a mile or two away from each other in the same reserve, the Adams Lake Reserve, and I live in the Nesconlith part, Nesconlis part of the reserve uh, right now. But uh, he uh, basically is a farmer. He has a large track of land, and he uh, subsidizes his, his, his livelihood by uh, farming. Uh, so I go out there and I help him hay, um, he, he bells hay he, with a tractor and he, he bells it and I help him put it in his barn and we go out and I help him weed a garden here and there and, and, and I get compensated a bag of potatoes or some vegetables for, <laughs> for my help. Fair trade. Yeah, fair trade and it's, it's, it's organic and it's really great. Uh, so, but, uh, you know, but then there's, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's strange, there's a lot of people that certainly remember uh, what happened to Gustavo mm -hmm. Lake, and then of course there's another generation, and next decade comes in, or two, and people forget, and people never heard about it. Well, that's because it's not really being put out there front and center. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, of course, uh, a good one of the guys that was uh, a negotiator up there, a native guy, is an elder from Vancouver area here, named uh, Bill Bill Lightbaum. Uh, he's also uh, a regular on a number of different radio shows, a co-op radio show here in Vancouver, and. Uh, and uh, he recently has been putting out uh, the need for uh, an inquiry uh, for, Gu for Gustafson Lake 15 years later because so much was uh, just shoved underneath the rug. Uh, the whole question is on the, uh, what they actually did, what the RCMP did, what the military's position was. And uh, I mean, and, and, and it got downright dirty in a lot of sense. Uh, like, for, for instance, myself, uh, after Gustafson Lake, um, that they couldn't really charge me with anything, and everything was, and I always said that even under Canadian law, I had the right to defend myself against outright aggression by, uh, by the Canadian military um, and or the RCMP. And, uh, and of course, because they couldn't get me, there was a really been, uh, a big vendetta and uh, I actually had operations commanders telling certain people that uh, were at Gustafson Lake that we're going to get him. We're going to get split in the sky. Uh, there was a fellow who had been in uh, uh, residential school, and it was an elder, elder native guy from the area here, and, um, and his name was Sam George. And we had, were out, it just so happens that we were out at a sweat lodge ceremony out in Mission, and uh, a friend of mine named Jimmy. Uh, said that this guy Sam wanted to talk to me, right? So I said, sure, after the sweat. So we did the, uh, I, I says, what's up, you know, what's happening? And he says, uh, well, he said, I just want you to know, he says that uh, I work for the, uh, I'm an undercover agent, operative for the emergency response team, uh, E Division here in, uh, in Vancouver. I said, oh yeah, so, so what, uh, what, what's up? <laughs> what's up, <laughs> you know? He says, well, he says, I just want you to know that the RCMP, right, uh, we're going to, wanted to pay me thousands of dollars to help set, help set you up with a cache of weapons. I said, oh, really? I said, well, I'm not really surprised because that's just the mode of operations that I know of in my, all my years of encounters with law enforcement. I says, uh, but uh, I'm glad to know that. Now, now, me personally, I'm thinking I had promised him that I would never say anything about it while he was still working for them. He asked me to, you know, not say anything. But when he retired, he said, feel free to say whatever you want. And he, if he was called in to, to testify to it, he would after he had retired. So now I'm putting the RCMP on notice, right, that I intend to sue the RCMP for trying to set me up to send me to prison, right, for a cache of weapons that I never had. And it's probably the same cache of weapons that the RCMP used with Peter Montague and the rest of those that was the spokesperson during the standoff, they, they, they produced the cache of weapons that was supposed to have come out of fully automatics and semi-automatics and everything else that was supposed to have come out of uh, Gustafson Lake, but in all reality, it was a cache of weapons that they retrieved from somewhere up in Smithers. 
So it was, it was all projections to try to paint us as quote unquote terrorists, mm -hmm. as opposed to, as to, and we always said, we are not terrorists, we are sovereignists. The real terrorists came with us, came at us with the guns. And the real terrorists are the ones that pointed and threatened us and all we did is take a defensive stance. Your life has changed, gone through many changes. It has, yes. We won't talk about Attica, we've talked about that before, yes. but from mm -hmm. Attica to Gustafson Lake, you've been a political activist. How was it that you started getting into films? Well, in, uh, actually it was uh, 1990, well it was eight years ago, so it was 1999, I believe. No, no, in 2002, there was a, I'm a carpenter by trade, and uh, there wasn't much work up there. I live in the Chase area, outside of Kamloops, and uh, there wasn't really much work out there, so I um, was just reading one of the local papers over there, the Sushwap News, and inside of there, there was, uh, there was an ad for extras for a movie called Deepwater, with Lucas Black and uh, Leslie M. Warren and Peter Coyote. And I said, geez, you know, uh, well, for 10 bucks an hour, you can go over there as an extra, right? You can sit around and eat all day until they're ready to film me. I says, you know, I, I was pretty low on bucks then, so I said, well, I, I, I'm going to go to Kamloops. So uh, I went over there with my partner, Sandra, and we went into Kamloops. And, uh, and when I got over there, the uh, director of the movie, his name was uh, David, Mar David Marfield. And uh, they were uh, outfits. Uh, the, the, their outfit was from uh, Los Angeles. And uh, he said, "Geez, you know something?" He says, uh, "You've got a presence about you." He says, uh, "He says we're looking, <laughs> we're looking for uh, a guy that um, who would be a native casino owner, right, by the name of Joe Littlefeet." And I says, "Oh yeah." And he says, uh, "Would you like to do a cold read for this guy?" I said, "Yeah, why not?" So I. Nothing to lose, I guess. Nothing to lose. <laughs> Everything to gain, possibly. So I did a cold read, and he said, geez, this man, that was really great, right? And I see, he says, yeah, we tried 27 people out in Vancouver, and uh, we're still not quite satisfied. But well, 10 days later, I got a call from them from, from Los Angeles and told me I had the part. So my very first movie was uh, Deepwater. And, uh, and I got the role as Joe Littlefeet. Now, it was a smaller role, but it was still a principal role. Uh, from that point on, it gave me the bug. I call it the, uh, you know, the, uh, you, you, get, you get the bug, uh, you know, to do something. And, and this year, I just, it, it, it brought out the bug juices in me to get out there and, and get, act, get into acting. And so did you, like, follow up on that? Did you go to agents and yes. try and